people might accept that as a correct response. What am I doing? Bribing. Good job. What am I doing? Bribing. That's right. <laughs> nice correction procedure. She always keeps on going back, okay? Good job, buddy. All right. When we're done, you can go wash your hands, okay? Okay. Let's do this. Good job. Do this. Do this. Do this. There you go. Good job. Do this. Ready? Do this. Do this. There you go. Good job, Kodo. Very. It only took her one trial to show him. It wasn't this. It was this. Okay. But those are some differences, and I got to tell you. Three-year-old kids can pretty much do those things, okay? Just like that. He's a little older than that. He needs to work on being able to imitate exactly as people are doing. But he got it in one trial, basically, so that was really good. Nice. What is it? Uh, door. door. That's right. So now he's what tacking or especially labeling. I'm the one to be washing my. I'm the one washing. You know, I wash hands. Okay. You can keep them sticky then. Don't you just love that? <laughs> I don't want to be. I don't want to be washing my hands. Oh, okay. well, be sticky then. That's okay. What is it? Uh, As he keeps putting his fingers. Okay. Good job, buddy. What is it? Corn. Corn. Very nice. Michael, how old are you? That's an intraverbal response because it's not controlled by the visual stimuli around, right? Controlled by the verbal stimulus. How old are you? Now, this is a rote one. And I want you to be aware there's rote intraverbals, and there's also ones that are transitory. Things change consistently. Now, so for instance, you go outside and you see somebody you do something with, come back in. Well, who did you see out there? Well, it's not going to be the same person all the time. It's going to be different people. What you do out there is going to be different each time. Okay? That's different than how old are you, because that's going to stay the same for quite a while, at least 365 days. Okay? What your name's going to stay with you the rest of your life. So that's a rote response. What happens with a lot of children is they'll learn a bunch of these rote responses, and then they'll just have those rote responses, and that's really not what we want. We want them to be able to deal with the transitory type of situations, too, where things change. What color is Jim's shirt today? Blue. Okay, and then next, what color is Jim's shirt today? On another day, when I'm not wearing a blue shirt, I'm wearing a white shirt or a black shirt. Can come to be able to tell you about what they saw. Who is there with you? Who do you have lunch with today? What did you eat for lunch? Well, you know, a lot of these kids eat the same things over and over again, and they eat with the same people, and so they give you these responses. Oh, good, so they give these answers, but they're not really learning to pay attention to subtle differences. So that's why, like in my clinic, when I have kids come in, sometimes I'll have them pay attention to Jim, and they'll say, oh, look at Jim. What color shirt's Jim wearing today? Oh, today it's a blue shirt. Good, okay, what color's Jim's shirt today? Blue. Well, then I'll come in another day, and say, well, I'll wear like a Hawaiian shirt with a parrot on it. Oh, he's wearing a a bird shirt. It's like, okay, good. Call it a bird shirt. What color is Jim? It's a bird shirt. So we get them start talking about things so they can pay attention to the differences that are changing around them. You know, what did you play today out on the playground? Well, one day it might be kind of a version of soccer, another maybe basketball or baseball or something like that or bowling. You want them to be able to come back and tell you about what they've done. But a lot of kids can't even do something simple like go outside get a drink from a drinking fountain. You say, oh, what are we doing? Getting a drink. Good. Where are we getting the drink from? We're getting it from the drinking fountain. Then they come back in and they say, well, what did you just do? They can't tell you that they went out and got a drink from the drinking fountain. How are they going to go home at the end of the day and tell their parents about what they did at school when they can't even go out and do something simple like that? So a lot of times we'll create situations for children where we'll get them to go out and do something. Say, oh, good, we're bouncing the ball. What are we doing? Bouncing the ball. Oh, good. Who are we bouncing the ball with? Oh, we're bouncing the ball with Jim. Good. Okay. Then they take him back. What did you just do? Bouncing the ball. Good. Who did you bounce the ball with? Jim. Where did you bounce the ball? Outside. Okay. So we start going through talking about it. But you've got to practice these things over and over and over again if we're hoping to get these kids to talk about their experiences in life, which is a huge part of uh, our social interaction for typical ch kids. But anyhow, we're building on it. We're building on it with examples like this. So how old are you? Wrote response? Five. Five. What's your mom's name? Now you notice that what the therapist did there was when the child didn't respond, you know, and what did she do? Put her head forward. Look at him. Okay? Like, I want you to give me more. She doesn't have to say, well, tell me. 
but that's what we do in life too. We use a lot of non-vocal communication to let others know we want or expect a little something different. And that's what she's doing. Get him to dial into the fact that, okay, tell me. She's done it a couple of times now, which is very, very sophisticated. A lot of times people don't do that. Just as a prompt, if you will, a subtle prompt that is normally used in regular communications amongst people to get him to respond. So it's, this is very good. He's attending to that. Very good. High five. That was pretty hard. Yeah, that's huh? kind of hard. What's, What's mommy's name? It's mommy. Name? Awesome. What's your dad's name? Mark. 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 Good job, buddy. What do you see? Blocks. Very good. Good job. Those are blocks. Right. Did you put the whole thing in your mouth? Good. Hey, you taste with your. Now. If she was just doing you taste with your and taught him the answer, that wouldn't be very good. With these questions, the therapist has already gone and said, well, we taste with our tongue, we smell with our nose, we see with our eyes. Already did units on this, so she's now coming back to this under a different context. So that's why she's prompting him through some of this. Tom, do you smell with your? Uh, no. Good. Michael, do you smell? Now, what do you think is going on here? Let's talk about motivation. She's chowing down on food, she's praising, but what do you see going on here? Huh? He's done. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's, he's starting to kind of go away, isn't he? He's not really putting out much effort at this point. He was, he was doing quite well, but now he's starting to kind of show that he's not so much interested. What, it, what I would say under these conditions is, is that the reinforcers are losing their values, the ones that are controlled, okay, by the instructor. So she could keep pushing on with the kid like this, but his behavior is already telling us something very valuable. Oh, uh, with your? No. No, very good, that's great. I'm done. <laughs> and he can also tell you with his words. Good job, kid. Good job. When did you wear a jacket? Introverbal. When do you wear a jacket? You know, when do you wear boots? When do you wear swimming trunks? Okay, all kinds of stuff like that. When do you wear uh, weird costumes? You know, Halloween. You know, so you got all these kind of introverbals in this a true introverbal. Okay, because it's not there. It rains. When it's raining, that's right. Good job, buddy. <clears throat> See, by the time you're developing. Lollipop. Yeah, lollipop. Is it sweet or sour? Sweet. By the time you're developing the interverbals, you already have a fairly uh, extensive vocabulary. Otherwise, you couldn't talk about things if you don't know what the things are. Okay? So that's why a lot of the interverbal training, you have to mix it up with the children. Okay? It's not just teaching them to answer questions, but it's really talking about things. Okay? So now here it's just talking about a lollipop. Find a lollipop. And up. And up. And up. And up. In the, in the haircut place. In the haircut place? In the haircut place. When they cut your hair, they give you a lollipop? Yes. That is so fabulous. Good job. Yeah, no. she, she, Lolly, the teacher there, just goes crazy when all of a sudden he says, in the haircut place? You get it? You get a lollipop in the haircut place? And I was just like, she didn't know that. And see, that's the kind of information we want kids to be giving us, is to be talking about their experiences. That's true introverbal behavior when it's not just memorized answers, but they're actually being able to relate to you about things that you have, don't have access to. You don't know what happened. Okay? That's what we're trying to get from these kids. So it takes a lot of training. We can't just have a trial here and a trial there. We really have to work on developing that repertoire. That's where a lot of these training programs for kids with autism, you know, they collect the, the number of words that the child knows, and they got their data that says they know 243 whatever words expressively. But are they teaching them to talk about those things? And if they don't teach them to talk about those things, they're really leaving the kid with just the names of items, but without a way of actually using that for social interaction, communication, if you will, uh, having conversations. And so that's why we have to develop that, okay? Here's how you might collect some data on, on that type of behavior. So you ride in a, and then what kind of a response do they give for you? things you eat, popcorn, chips, cookies, grapes. You could also put in novel things that they happen to, to say. 
just like we saw with the children, they start giving us some novel responses once they've got these other associations acquired. And we can just do simple pluses. We can do, did they have it the first time we asked them for the day that say you ride in, did they come up with car? Well, they came up with car, but they didn't do boat, plane, or bus. After we train all these other ones, other things you ride in, maybe the next day when you come in the first trial, you'll see that they got that they could ride in a car, a plane, and a bus, but they still miss boat, and we can work on it. We can also, if we're always getting consistent minuses, what we can also do is have a first trial of the day response. Did they get it right the first time we asked them? Or did they get it right at the end of the session? So that's what the slash represents. He, got, he missed boat at the beginning of the day, but by the end of the session, he was getting it correct. Okay. And so we can keep track, are they learning it within the session? Just like with that little boy Daniel, he learned tape by the end of the session, but will he remember it tomorrow? That's an entirely different issue, okay? I want to talk about another topic that many people often miss too when working with children. They teach them to ask for things like, you know, to be tickled or to go outside or something to eat, maybe even specific food items like, you know, Cheetos or chips or Chex Mix or whatever it is the kid likes at the moment. But what we also want to do is not just leave it at that. There's this whole section we call advanced mans, being able to ask for things using pronouns, <coughs> prepositions, adjectives, and so on. I want the big ball. I want the red ball. I want the ball under the table. I want the ball that's on top of the table. I want daddy's hat. I want John's shoes. So being able to ask for things, you know, I want his shoes, her shoes her hat, his hat, so forth. We want them to be able to use all these different ways to ask for things. We also need to teach them to ask for information like where something's going to take place, when something's going to take place, who has something, and so forth. So we want kids to learn to ask all these different types of questions. The problem is most people don't know how to teach that very well because it's not just about teaching them to ask that question. It really involves another motivational variable. Usually when kids are asking for something, it's because they want something else, okay? So if you're asking for the red ball or you're asking where the ball is, for instance, I'm sorry, when you ask where the ball is, it's because you want the ball. So you have the motivation for the ball, and now that you don't have the ball, you want some information about how you can get access to the ball. So that's really the second motivational condition. So you really have to set a lot of these procedures up to get the kids to be able to do it. One of the ways I used to do this was I'd give a child an index card with a stick figure drawing of a swing on it, and then when the kids would go outside and they wanted to get on the <coughs> swing because they liked the swing, I'd have somebody there intercept the child and say, oh, well, where's your swing card? And so the child would give them the swing card. Okay, good, you can get on the swing. they start being pushed. Now that I've given them the swing card to go out to get onto the swing to use it, or pass, basically, if you will, now all of a sudden what I'll do is I'll send them out sometime and they don't have the swing pass. And so they get this, well, where's your swing card? You know, and they don't have it. Oh, then you got to go ask Jim. Ask him for a swing card. They come back and ask for a swing card. Good. So I give him a swing card. Then he goes and gives it to the person. So we're setting them up, basically. Then, now all of a sudden, needs a swing card. Comes to me. Where's, he, he says, swing card. Want swing card? Uh, oh, well, I put it somewhere. Now, they don't know what to do under those conditions. So I'd say, oh, well, I put it. Say, ask me, say, where did I put it? Where'd you put it? Put it over here on the desk. So I go over to the desk, give it to them, good. And they say, next time they come back, one swing card, good. Oh, well, I put it somewhere. And then they say, then you teach me, well, where did you put it? Oh, I put it over here, or under here, or up on here, or in my pocket. Okay? And so I now start teaching me ask for where things. What I can also do is I can use that same procedure, but instead of saying I put it somewhere, which indicates a location, I can say, I gave it to somebody. And then I can teach them to say, who did you give it to? Oh, I gave it to Sue. I gave it to Mary. I gave it to Elizabeth. So again, now all of a sudden, it's okay, now you teach them to ask, oh, I gave it to someone. And then you teach them to say, who? I put it somewhere. And they say, where did you put it? So we're starting to teach them to make some discriminations like that. But you have to almost set these things up. Because kids aren't just going to start asking, where is it? If they've never had to. They just come up and they ask for it and they get it. Why should they ask for information about where it is? You've got to teach them those sets of skills. So that's what you're going to see in this next set of videos here is how we would actually do this. What we did was we would set up a procedure whereby we put the child you know, in the classroom and we'd say, get your frog or something, and we'd hand him an empty bucket and he'd go, well, where's the frog? Well, I gave it to somebody or I put it somewhere. Or I could say, it's in that bag. So I could tell him where it is. So again, 
This is how we teach it. I just want you to kind of see how it's actually done in real life here. But your teacher, Lori has it. Now you notice what he said when he goes up there. Lori has it. Okay. So he's just repeating back what he heard. Now what he's got to do is he's got to take that information that we gave him. Lori has it, and now he's got to turn that into a man for him. I want frog, whatever, okay? But this takes specific training. It doesn't just happen. doing again though. He's got a lot of skills to learn, doesn't he? He's got to learn how to interrupt somebody when they're in the middle of doing something, get their <coughs> attention, wait for them to react, and then he's got to be able to ask the question, the appropriate question. But he's already gone. Kristen has it. <laughs> he's banging on her. It's like, okay, got a lot to work on. It's not just about asking for information, but it's not how you then use that information to go get what you want and socially interact appropriately with others. So there's a lot of skills involved. It's not easy. And that's why a lot of people don't teach it. Now, they kind of, if kids get it, great. If they don't get it, what do we do? Well, we've got to get in there and teach it. So it comes down to. Bed. Bed. What's up? Time for one. Tense. Oh, good asking. Thank you, Chris. Here you go. Yes, there it is. Nice job. Where'd it go? What is it? What is it? Okay, you ready? Find your frog. I gave it to a teacher. Who has it? Lisa has it. But listen to what he says when he gets there. So he's doing trial after trial. He he's needs to work on that, doesn't it? You see, it doesn't just come by a couple of trials. This is why I emphasize to people, if you really want to teach these skills, you have to do it over and over and over again with varying contexts. Because just a couple of trials often isn't sufficient for the acquisition of the skill and all the social interaction pieces that are involved with it. It takes a lot. <laughs> Okay, so that's kind of your little taste, if you will, of the advanced man. There's so many different other procedures that could be done with that too, but that's a good place to get started, okay? You have to set it up. Now, this next sequence, again, nobody's seen this one. I've never shown this one before, but this is a mixed verbal behavior session, and it, it's got a lot of nice quality. We could actually sit here and talk with it, probably talk about it probably for hours. It's only about 20 minutes long, but it could take a long time to discuss all the different pieces that are going on. But I want you to kind of take a look at this and, and see how skillful this, this woman is working with Joey. Okay, she's a speech and language pathologist. She's had a lot of training. She's worked with Joey for a number of years. She knows him. She knows how to capture the motivation, knows how to draw things out of him. But it's a mixture of interverbal tacks and mans and receptive instructions. It's very, very nice, okay? It's fun, and that's another part. Learning should be fun, okay? But you'll see her teaching. It's not just they're playing. A lot of times people watch people who are skillful at teaching and they miss the point that the teaching is going on. They don't see it. They say, oh, well, they're just playing with them and they're learning so much by playing. It's like, no, they're teaching. They're teaching because they know how to teach <coughs> and how to make it fun for the child so that they, they're drawing out these responses and getting more and more sophisticated responses. It's not just playing, okay? But it's actual teaching. So, and we could, that's why I say we could literally go through this out for hours, going through what type of trial that was and what was happening there, where the correction procedure was, where the expansion of the phrases were coming in, and so forth. But let's just watch. Here we go. Hey, Joe. Yes, it's snowing out. I'll play in the snow. We can play in the snow. I can make a snowman in the snow. 
What can you do in the snow? Make a snowman a snowball. Oh, oh, a snowman and a snowball? Pretty neat. Okay, so now this is where you start taking a look at it. Okay, he's coming up with some novel responses. It's not just the snowman. She's not just repeating back. Also now talking about other things you can make. This is an introvertible. Okay, he's talking about things that he can do with that. Yeah. You're right. You can make a snowman and a snowball. Is snow hot or cold? Cold. It is cold. It is cold. And now he's not responding based upon feeling that it's cold because he's not outside. He's inside where it's warm. So he's doing this as an introverbal response. When it snows, it's cold outside. So he's already learned that introverbal association. It's not based on the coldness of the air around him. Okay, so this is an introverbal as opposed to what we call a tact or an expressive label. If we went outside and said, how does it feel out here to go cold? That would be a tact <coughs> because it is cold outside and you're feeling the change in the temperature that you're, you're labeling, okay? But it's different when you're talking about, oh, when it snows outside, it, you know, what's it like outside? Well, it's cold outside. That's, that's an introverbal, okay? That's not controlled by the temperature itself, okay? It's controlled by what you know about those conditions. Cold. That's right. Today, we are going to start playing upstairs. Oh, nice standing. Hmm, what room should we start in today? Don't we love up? And don't we know? Would you like to start in your room? Yeah. You could say, I want to start in my room. I want to start in my room. Okay, so now he's mandating to go to his room, because that's, that's a man that's controlled by the motivational variable to play in his room. But now she's using an echoic response to get him to be able to request more specifically in the right formal aspects. I want to play in my room or I want to play in Joey's room, whatever, okay? No. Let's think about what we're going to play in your room. Should we play, oh, how do we stand? Be quiet. Yes. Hey, nice standing. <laughs> what should we play upstairs in your room? Should we play jumping on the bed, or pillow fight, or hiding with the pillow? Jump, jump on the bed. Do you jump want to jump on the bed? Jump up. Yet? All right, come here. I will jump on the bed, please. Okay. So, Who is going to go, who's going to go upstairs? Gigi. I am going to go upstairs. I am, I am. I am. Who else is going upstairs? I am. <gasps> Who else is going upstairs? Mm -hmm. Take a look around. Who else? Stephanie. Stephanie is. All right, let's. So this is good. So now this who else is going to go upstairs is now attacked because Stephanie's there. So it's partially attack controlled there too, okay? So there's, when we talk about these different verbal operants, we separate them out as individual units. But in reality, what comes together as we're interacting, they really are multiply controlled all the time. So part attack. Part echoic. And husband said, What do you want to play upstairs? And she started giving him all the options, and then he said, Jumping on the bed, which is one of the things that's partially echoically controlled. Okay, it's not just the motivation that he wants to go jump on the bed, but there's also because of her producing that other verbal stimulus, jump on the bed, that partially controlled response, too. That's why when we tear the language apart into these separate little pieces, you have to realize that it, when we're interacting, on an ongoing basis, they really start coming together, and oftentimes it's multiply controlled. Because if you say something, oh, would you like, what would you like to drink? And I look around and I see water, <laughs> well, I'd like to have some water. If I look over and see some coffee, I might say coffee. And I could also say something like, um, I want to drink a soda or a pop or something like that. I could do that even though I don't see any of those. So again, much of our behavior really is multiply controlled by what's around us, what we see. <coughs> as well as our motivational variables and the questions people are asking. So it's not just so easy to kind of break them into those pieces. When you start putting them back together, you have to kind of mix things up, okay? That's how life is. All right, here we go. Let's go! Come on! Oh, hey, you know what? Could you tell our friend Stephanie, say, come on upstairs, Stephanie. Come on up there, Stephanie. We're going to play. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that was good. That was a fairly long call response. Go, 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 go.
Now, when people do stuff like that, come on upstairs, Stephanie. Come on upstairs. That's an echoic response, okay? Saying what she said. However, that's something that would be used under other conditions. So, under similar conditions, when they're going somewhere, oh, let's let's ask Stephanie to come along. What do you say to her? You know, come on, Stephanie, or you know, whatever. So again. She's teaching skills that can be generalized to all different types of conditions, but she's also expanding out the echoic repertoire to be able to say a longer phrase. It takes a lot of practice. You've got to know what those words are and how they fit together, too. Here we go. Oh, you know what? Joe, I don't need All right, turn on the light. Turn on the light. We don't want the fan. Well, jump up and down. Well, first we can jump up and down on top of the comforter. That's much better. Da -da 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 -da. Whoa, you are jumping all by yourself. Did he get it? Jump up and down, please. Yes, he can. How about, can you help me jump up and down? Can you help me jump up and down? Oh, that was better. This is the way we jump up and down. See, apparently, it's fun to jump on the bed, but it's more fun when somebody's helping you because you probably get a little more air when you're jumping or something like that. It's a little more exciting, okay? So now it's like, okay, she's saying you're jumping all by yourself, and now she probably knows that he probably wants to have her to help, too, because it's more fun that way. So she's prompting, okay, well, you can man for this, basically, is what she's saying in so many words without saying, you know, ask me, okay? Oh, she, hey, help me sing. Help me sing. You sing. This is. I can't hear you louder. This is the day when we jump on and jump. Jump on and jump. Get up! I will fall, we please. Baby, can we have a fall, we please? Can you throw me, please? Say you fall, we please. Yes, I can. Oh, no, more do heavy! Oh, 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 dear. Oh, hang on. Oh, oh, no. Oh, what am I dropping? Oh, no. Oh, oh no. Oh, crash. Can you get a flowy, please? Again? Yes. Do you want me to throw you? Yes. Can you tell you for me, please? Should I crash you on the bed? Yeah. All right, fast or slow? Fast. All right, let's go. Get ready. Come on. Get out of here. Hold on. Oh, oh no. Oh, no. Oh, you a fast crash. Are you ready? Oh, 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 Slowly, please. Okay, so see, she's getting a lot of different behaviors out of him, and it just looks like they're having fun spurred around on the bed, you know, jumping up and down, being tossed on the bed. But there's actually a lot of conceptual pieces which are being taught here and used under these conditions. So it's not just playing. She knows what she's doing in terms of developing the specific language skills that he needs to learn to be able to interact with people when he's in a playful situation like that. Can I throw you again? Yes. Oh no, we're all done with throwing. Now what should we do? Jump on and down. Oh, do you want to jump up and down? Yes. All right, let's go. This is the way. Should I talk slow or fast? Fast. Fast? Do you want me to sing fast? Yes. Okay. This is the way we jump up and down. Jump up and down. Jump up and down. This is the way we. Oh, no! It'd be kind of hard to do this in a classroom situation. Dad and Pete. First, we start at the feet. Yeah. All right, here we go. Get ready. First, we start at the feet. Feet. The spider is crawling on the feet. Then we go where? Up the legs. Up the legs. Then we go up the legs, and we stop at the knees. Did you say knees? Yes. Oh, there you go, knees. 
then we go to the... You notice how she started with first we start at the and then names the body part and then goes from there and again you're going to see later she actually changes it was start at a different place and go so it's kind of nice because you're teaching about you know some of the words we use about you know starting and first and then where we're going to stop and what's next and so on so she's using a lot of words that didn't pay attention to what those words actually mean and how we use them it's not just say first is this and then we did this sitting down at a table okay touch the ball now touch the cup good what do we touch first first we touch the ball you could do it that way but she's introducing the same concepts and teaching them in the context of just playing around with them. It's much high, high motivational condition here for them. Bully. Bully? Yeah. Boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, boom. 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 And then we go to the chip. Start at the feet. Start at the feet. How about if we start at the chin and go down? First we start at the chest. Can you be a dinosaur? A dinosaur. A dinosaur. Can you be a dinosaur and bite? I like me. Can you be a dinosaur? Dinosaur, a dinosaur, a dinosaur. Can you be a dinosaur and crawl like me? Oh, are you crawling? All right, let's crawl on top of the bed. Go on top of the bed. So how do you learn prepositions? Now, you, in the context of using them. I am going to get a tickle. Tickle? I'm going to get a pillow. Don't go rushing off to call Child Protective Services. It's okay. Okay. It's okay. Just like with the wet, wet underwear in the face, you know. It's like, no, this is okay. He's having fun. This is good stuff. Here we go. One, two, three, go. Boom, boom, boom. Again, then you need Again. to go sleep. Next to the zebra. Oh, you want me to go to sleep next to the zebra? Yes. Here I come. So now he's manding for her to go to a specific Here's location. The zebra. Next to All right. prepositions. I think the zebra is down here on the floor, if I'm not mistaken. Right next to her down there somewhere. <laughs> Who's waking me up? E Who's waking me up? Who's under there? Me go sleep next to the zebra. I don't want to sleep next to the zebra. You want to go sleep next to the 